and welcome back to Miss Hannah Loves Grammar. In this video, we're concentrating on the character of Banquo, who's often seen as pretty one dimensional and is viewed in an overly simplistic fashion. Critics stress his loyalty, obedience, that he's an honest man, seeing him as the better part of Macbeth, the road that Macbeth didn't take, if you like. Yet, Banquo is much more perplexing than that upon closer reading of this play. And actually, like Macbeth, is a morally ambiguous character who lacks the clarity of being either totally good or totally bad. After all, he, like Macbeth, is disturbed by the witch's prophecies and does to some extent entertain a guilty hope that those prophecies could be realised. He suspects that Macbeth might be guilty of regicide, yet he does nothing about it, but instead swears in Act 3, Scene 1, an indissoluble tie, saying that he'll do anything, um, always in the duty to follow Macbeth. These actions are not what I would describe as brave, loyal, and the noble subject that we often assume Banquo is. Instead, I want to suggest in this video that Banquo is compromised, as the ideas in the witches are planted in him have really taken stake in his mind, and the judgment of his loyalty then is shaken to its core, should he be loyal to the king or to his best friend. Banquo's importance as a foil to Macbeth is clear from the opening moments of the play. Just as our first introduction to Macbeth is from the captain who tells of his valour in the battlefield, so we learn of Banquo's ferocity and actually the scale of the victory they both created in that same speech in Act 1, Scene 2. Both Banquo and Macbeth are linked here. When the captain says, so they doubly redoubled strokes upon the foe. We learn of how dangerous that particular battlefield was. And I think the repetition of double through doubly and redoubled shows you how brave the captain sees these men as. I think we also get a sense of how good actually Banquo is in his own right as a hero of war. Duncan later acknowledges in Act 1, Scene 4, that Banquo's role in defeating the enemy is as good as the General Macbeth, and actually that he deserves great rewards for his actions. He says, Noble Banquo, thou hast no less deserved, nor must be known less to have done so. It's significant, though, that despite both their joint enterprise on the battlefield, only Macbeth gets the title. He gets the promotion. While Duncan still acknowledges noble Banquo, he doesn't really show the same level of gratitude. And it's even more ironic to think that Macbeth gets his reward and Banquo doesn't, but it's Macbeth who's unhappy with his position and is prepared to kill the king in a matter of scenes by Act 2, while Banquo never shows any sign of bitterness and, in fact, is the absolute opposite of being discontent in that moment. Indeed, he is really gracious and loyal to Duncan and tells the king, there if I grow, the harvest is your own. Those words are simple and there's a purity to those words that are more than heartfelt. I think the semantic field of nature there, I grow and harvest, acknowledges something of how pure we're meant to perceive Banquo at this time. But also he's saying, anything you give me, I hope it yields something good for you, King Duncan. It's an admirable quality. It's interesting to note the difference between Banquo's honest simplicity here and his quite short discussion with Duncan versus Macbeth's longer speech and then his really quite intense move to his dark desires at the end of Act 1, Scene 4. The contrast between Macbeth and Banquo become much more clearly established when they meet the witches for the first time in Act 1, Scene 3. We see that Macbeth's physical courage is matched by this really intense ambition as he pleads with the witches, stay you imperfect speakers, 
tell me more. There's a desperation to it as Macbeth is impatient to know from which authority the witches have found their information. But Banquo is much more calm and purposeful, more interested in what the witches are. He describes them as so withered and so wild in their attire. And he asks, are you aught that man may question? As if to say, like, you know, can I get answers from you or are you just meant to be weird looking? You know, what's the deal here? I'm not sure how seriously he at first entertains the future they offer. It's so much so that Banquo is actually not trusting false appearances. He seems suspicious of the danger that these witches pose, showing he's far more perceptive than Macbeth. And on that note, he even jokes with Macbeth in Act 1, Scene 3. Or have we eaten on the insane route that takes reason prisoner? And what he means by that is, have we, by some magic here, consumed hemlock or something? Have we taken a drug that means we lose our senses? There's a real sense of how the supernatural is at work here. And, you know, by all means, click on the link above to the supernatural video I have that tells you more about the witches if you're interested. The key thing that's interesting is that when Macbeth learns he's been awarded the title of Thane of Cawdor, he immediately assumes the witch's prophecy that he would be king will happen. He asks Banquo if he hopes his children will be kings, given that the prophecies are coming true. Warily though, Banquo says, that we can be lured into the evil by such temptation. And when he says in Act 1, Scene 3, and oftentimes to us, to our harm, the instruments of darkness tell us truths, win us with honest trifles to betray us in deepest consequence. This is wisdom. He's saying you might be won round by these instruments of darkness that tell you truths in inverted commas. But actually, these are agents of evil. The, the phrase instruments of darkness says it all. And it's so key that he describes it as honest trifles that then betray the deepest consequence. That superlative deepest adds to this. The idea of leading to your own self-destruction. And this foreshadows what Macbeth will say in a matter of moments and do by the start of Act 2. That fatal decision to commit regicide and kill the king is all that Banquo has suggested here, the damage that we have when we listen to those like the witches. So note it here, both Macbeth and Banquo are offered these tempting visions of the future, but at least it seems like Macbeth is the only one who falls for it. While Macbeth struggles with his guilty conscience, we know he's got the crown on his mind. Banquo appears free from both envy, doubt, and dare I say it, torment. As the play progresses, Banquo finds it harder to resist temptation. Like Macbeth, he no longer sleeps, admitting to his son Fleance that he's struggling to restrain this cursed set of thoughts and is troubled by the witches. He says in Act 2, Scene 1, I dreamt last night of the three weird sisters. However, there are significant differences between Banquo and Macbeth at this stage in the play. Banquo readily admits to being tempted by the witch's prophecies. Macbeth does not. Banquo calls upon merciful powers to help him fight these troubling thoughts. The idea of calling upon heavenly angels comes to mind with the um, adjective merciful. And yet we learn from what he hides and shares only with us as the audience in Act 1, Scene 4, the idea that Macbeth is struggling with these, well, evil forces of darkness, hiding his black and deep desires. He's secretive and deceptive, yet Banquo freely admits he's troubled by their prophecies. So Banquo retains nobility here. There's nothing wrong with being tempted, right? Banquo is not contemplated acting on any of these desires like his bestie Macbeth has. Banquo reacts honourably to Macbeth's hint that he, Macbeth, will reward Banquo if he supports him. He says in Act 2, Scene 1, If you cleave to my consent, 
when tis it shall make honour for you. An interesting turn of phrase that basically says there's something in it for you if you're loyal to me. If you cleave, that's to, to cling to something, then something good will happen to you. But Banco's reply is really interesting. It offers us a real glimpse at how even he might be privately wrestling with his conscience. He says in response in Act 2, Scene 1, So I shall lose none in seeking to augment it. But still keep my bosom franchised and allegiance clear, I shall be counselled. He's saying I'll be loyal and as loving as I can be, but I've got to keep my conscience clear. To augment is to change. His talking here of his bosom is probably talking about his friendship and the closeness that he looks to keep. The idea of keeping your allegiance clear is about your conscience with God. And in these times when people talk of being counselled, they're thinking of God's counsel. Here he's saying he believes in the divine right of kings. He believes God decides what he should be doing. Banquo's showing moral courage here for an audience of the Jacobean times to fully understand. And he's standing up to Macbeth in an admirable way. But he also is making a fatal mistake. On the one hand, standing up to Macbeth and saying that he will betray neither the king nor his conscience is brave. But then abstaining from any action once Macbeth murders Duncan proves that this was a bit of a false thing to share. Didn't he already suspect his friend might have done this? So let's consider it. Macbeth knows that Banquo is brave and noble. So much so that in Act 3, Scene 1, now that he's king, he's getting more paranoid about those who know him well and who can make wise choices. He ascribes Banquo as someone who hath a wisdom that doth guide his valour. He's great at acting safely and bravely to get what he wants. That verb guide is seen in a bad light here. The other side of that same combination of bravery and intelligence, of course, means that Banquo is a huge threat and danger to Macbeth. He knows too much for Macbeth's comfort and he's more than capable of acting bravely and resourcefully if he decides to confront Macbeth. Macbeth admits he fears that there is none but he whose being I do fear. And I think the vulnerability of sharing the verb fear says everything. Perhaps this is because of what the witches said. In Act 1, Scene 3, they did say he'd be father to a line of kings. Yet Macbeth knows his is a fruitless crown. After the murder, we witness a significant deterioration in Banquo's morality. On learning of the murder, Banquo is appalled, vowing against the undivulged pretense I fight of treason treasonous malice. He's making a pledge here that... Before God, he will fight any of the treasons that he sees have happened and he will try to bring to justice whoever has committed this dreadful murder. However, we learn quite quickly that Banquo's vow and his obvious suspicion of Macbeth are not going to lead to any action from him. In his short soliloquy in Act 3, Scene 1, Banquo articulates his doubts about the newly appointed king. And he suspects that foul play has brought Macbeth to the throne. He says, and I fear thou played most foully for it. I think the synergy between both these men using the verb fear here is interesting. But equally, the idea that there's been foul play, it reeks as a crime for him. Banquo has now become a really ambiguous character, morally anyway. He knows he should do something. But actually... He doesn't say a word. The witch has predicted that his children will one day ascend to the throne. Banquo now appears far less inclined to dismiss the witches as mere instruments of darkness. Banquo does not stand up to Macbeth, though, or flee the country, as Macduff does. He appears to accept Macbeth's reign, saying, let your highness command upon me. He's willing to attend the banquet, not that he'll live to be there without being a ghost, to celebrate Macbeth's coronation and appear happy to serve on the council estate. At no stage, though, does Banquo utter his fears or share his doubts about Macbeth's rule with anyone 
but us, the audience. Banquo is fundamentally good, a moral person, but like Macbeth, he's been tainted somewhat by the witch's evil and their temptation. Something else to add is that obviously he will wreak his revenge, but by the end of the same scene that he utters those words, murderers are sent to kill him and his son. And yet, one of the most famous and iconic moments of all ghosts in theatre history, not just Shakespeare, is Banquo's ghost. When Macbeth explains why he must kill Banquo, he says to the murderers, our fears in Banquo stick deep and his royalty of nature reigns that which would be feared. Again, fear again from Macbeth. Essentially, we're better off without him because he could do real damage to the future of the throne and my future as king right now in the moment. But of course, as I've stated already, Act 3, Scene 4 sees the ultimate revenge, the ghost of Banquo haunting Macbeth in his inaugural uh, banquet as king. So much so that Macbeth, fearful, says, don't shake thy gory locks at me. Some view Banquo as, as I referenced earlier, a foil to Macbeth. An example of the way Macbeth should have behaved, but didn't. I think it's fair to say, though, that Banquo shifts from being a noble and honourable character to someone who's much more conflicted as his character unfolds. He also possesses some of the flaws that Macbeth does, except we don't get a chance to see what he does. His untimely death might have saved him from more moral decline, for all we know. Both these characters are deceitful, they allow themselves to be tainted by the evil they encounter from the witches. I think it's interesting to refer to a critic. A.C. Bradley stresses that the image of Banquo as an innocent man with a guilty conscience should be questioned, as later in the play, he sees uh, Banquo's conscience as gradually diminished. So I, I see a question for you as, you know, is he a victim? Or should he have called Macbeth's bluff before Duncan's death? Would that have made this better? Over to you. Take to the comments. It'd be lovely to hear what you think.